This is Len Merlo, and this is his studio. He's an artist, an educator, a grandfather, and he also experienced one of the biggest cultural events of the 1960s, Woodstock. This is his story. Myself and a bunch of my friends from Elizabeth, New Jersey went to Woodstock. We just got in cars with a few things and drove up there. Well, 1969, it was the summer of 1969, so um, I had finished one year of college and um, I was working and I, as my summer job in construction building a new airport in Newark Airport. So, you know, through Rolling Stone magazine and, and, you know, the Village Voice and some of the local papers, you know, we found out about like some music festivals that were going to be happening that summer. And, you know, m myself and all my friends from Elizabeth, New Jersey, you know, we were really into going into see into New York, going to the Fillmore East, and going to concerts in New York. And a lot of the bands that we were that we really liked were going to be playing at some of the music festivals. I decided to buy tickets to the Atlantic City Pop Festival. It was called. It was a week before Woodstock. So I went to Atlantic City with a couple of my friends. It was at the old Atlantic City racetrack. And we saw most of the acts that were going to play in Woodstock the next week. Because there were, you know, I figured, well, I'm in New Jersey. I'll just go to Atlantic City. And I also bought tickets for Woodstock, not knowing what it was going to be. It was just going to be another music festival. Except that we were going to be able to camp out. How much were those tickets? Oh, I don't really remember. They weren't much. Maybe 20 bucks, maybe 15. There weren't a lot of money. The next week... It was going to be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at Woodstock. So I took off from my job on Friday. Thursday was my last day. And, you know, all my bosses at, at the airport said, Oh, you can't take off. Where are you going? You're going up there with, you know, to, with those hippies or whatever. I said, Yeah, we're going. <laughs> I'll see you next week. We left, we were going to leave that morning really early, like like 6 o'clock, 6.30 in the morning, 7 o'clock. So we were up there like by Friday afternoon because we had, you know, we weren't used to going upstate that much. So we really had no idea what to expect. There was no indication that the roads were going to be blocked or anything like that. So there were like two carloads of us, myself and two of my friends from my age, and then a couple of guys that were like, two or three years older than the uh, one Vietnam vet and a couple of guys that were his friends. So we went all up together in two cars. I, I went that week to an Army Navy store in Linden and bought like a, an old sleeping bag from the Army and because we had no experience camping. I grew up in the city, so I had no experience at all camping, none whatsoever. Um, my friend owns a butcher shop in, in Elizabeth and um, before we went, he wanted to go, but his father wouldn't let him leave work because he had to work in the shop. So um, he filled a brown bag with canned goods and gave it, gave that to us for food and a couple of loaves of bread, I think. And that was about all we brought with us, you know, some a tent. Somebody had a tent. I don't remember who it was, but that's what we did. We got it. Oh, here's a good story. We go to pick up this one guy uh, who was going to come with us. He was one of the other guy's cousins. And he was an older guy, you know, he was like maybe in his mid-20s, 26, 27. So he was from a different era than my group. So we go to pick him up. So he comes out of his house with two bottles of scotch, dressed up in, in dress clothes with wingtip shoes and silk socks on. <laughs> That's him go that was him going to Woodstock. <laughs> so anyway, we drove up there that morning. Up the New York State Thruway, we, you know, we had, there was no cell phone, no GPS, none of that. We just used the map and we figured out how to get there. We took the exit. We, we went through town and um, we noticed there, were a lot of, there was a lot of activity um, when we got there. The roads weren't clogged up. I mean, we drove right through the center of town. We drove out to where the festival was and we looked for a parking space. So we passed by the gate. When we passed by the gate, the fences already were down. There was, no, there was no entrance. People were just walking in over the fences. 
So we find, we parked the car. I had a Volkswagen that I drove with my two of my friends, and they had like a big sedan with like maybe four guys in it. And uh, we all drove together. You know, we found a parking spot. We went off to the side of the road, and we walked down to the, you know, where you, there was like a walkway that went in, but there was no entrance, no fencing, nothing like that. So the one guy that we were with, um, he had big wide bell bottoms, like navy bell bottoms on. He had a big hat on. Um, he had a black beard. He he looked Hispanic, even though his name was Terranova. He was Italian. Um, he had a fringe vest on, but he looked like Carlos Santana. So as we're walking down, all these young girls, you know, I, I mean, I was a young guy. All these girls kept coming up to him and asking him for the, his autograph. So he starts signing autographs of that he was Carlos Santana, you know. And by the time we got down to where we were going, there was like maybe 15 girls following him down. <laughs> Once we got onto the field, what we did was we sort of went and found the spot uh, up on top of the hill, in kind of in the woods where there was some shade because it was a hot day on that Friday. It wasn't raining and it was hot and humid. We set up like a little campsite uh, up in the woods, up on top of the hill, looking down towards the stage. And we figured, well, you know, once the music starts, we'd be able to walk back and forth. My friend Joe Marino ha had just returned from Vietnam, so he had plenty of experience uh, of, you know, setting up a campsite. So we set up the tent and he had the foresight because he had, we had, new, had checked the weather, that he dug a trench around the tent in case it rained so that we wouldn't get soaking wet. So he set it all up like like he was doing in a hooch in Vietnam. That's what he was used to. So, you know, we threw our stuff in the tent. I mean, whatever we had, sleeping bags and some canned food. And we sort of walked down to where the show was going to be. And by that time, the stage was all set up. And we walked right down to the, to the, right, uh, to the left side of the stage. And there was a, like a big wooden fence, maybe six, seven feet tall, higher than a person. So we sort of set ourselves up along that fence and just were like people watching because it was like a show. <laughs> um, you know, people were coming by. They were, you know, uh, hippies from California, Hell's Angels, you know, all kinds of variety of people that, you know, we were just, we, we were city kids not used to seeing this kind of activity at all. So we were just like in awe. So, uh, you know... The, a couple of guys that were older, and they were funny. <laughs> a girl, a, a girl came walking by with a halter top. She was about six foot tall. She had a big uh, blonde afro, and inside of her afro was a monkey. <laughs> she had a pet monkey, and it was like entangled in her hair on her shoulder. And the <laughs> the guys that we were with just they just got the biggest kick out of that. They start flipping out, watching, you know, calling her, trying to talk to her, you know, and, and she's got this monkey in her hair. Oh, man, what a scene. Uh, anyway, we're sitting there, and, you know, they, and they're making announcements from the stage now. The show's going to start in an hour or two. We're waiting for this to come by, you know. And as we were waiting for the show to begin on that Friday afternoon, you could see that there, it was starting to get cloudy. There were some dark clouds in the distance, and the wind started picking up. Um, the... No one announced that Richie Havens was going to be the first act. They were just trying to prolong all the people who were gathering in front of the stage, and no one was ready to go on stage. So we were there for like hours, probably, just watching people going by and talking to people and laughing and, you know, joking and having a good time. You know, there were people climbing up on, already climbing up onto the uh, stanchions for a better view and things like that, because it started getting crowded. You could see there were only like paths of people walking along, and right along that fence was a path if you wanted to get up to the hill. So we were just standing there. Finally, um, finally, Richie Havens came out just with a guitar. And if you've ever seen the movie, you've seen that performance. And he just, once the music started, that was what kept the crowd calm because people were getting anxious. The clouds were kind of gathering, it was getting dark. And Richie Havens, with his act, just kind of calmed everything down. You know, people were listening to music, watching it, you know, people going back and forth, getting stuff to eat, buying stuff, you know. 
it was still fairly normal. There was no rain, no mud. It was just, you know, it was a nice day. I don't remember who came on after Richie Havens because as it started getting dark and you could see it was going to start raining, we made our way back up to um, where our tent was because I wasn't going to stand in the rain, you know, with all that going on. We saw a few of the acts. I remember seeing, uh, you know, throughout that first day, I only remember Richie Havens. I don't remember anything else. We may have just gone up to the tent and stayed there. But once it started raining, it poured. I mean, that evening, I think it, it was really coming down hard. So we were, there was like seven or eight guys. I, if I, you know, I don't want to count up now, but how many were in there? We were stuck in that little tent and we were just looking out and we were down here. If you're looking at this, here's the sage. We were like right here. So we had walked up the hill. So we ended up um, at our campsite. And out our tent, when we were looking out our tent, we saw this uh, smoke stand where there were a lot of people going to this stand. But we could see that from our, the entrance to our tent. So we were maybe uh, 40, 50 yards away from there. So it was pouring rain. And as it was pouring rain, the trench that my friend Joe Marino had built around our tent was push you know we didn't get wet really we were in good shape you know the water was going away and you know going down where he had sort of dug it to go down the hill so as we're in there we see these poor people coming by you know poor mostly young kids young guys mostly you know soaking wet no food no warmth so we grab once every once in a while we grab a guy and bring him in give him something to eat you know see where he was from or whatever and then they would be on their way. There was no animosity within the crowd. It was very, you know, it was really uh, um, people coming together and helping each other in a bad situation. Because the mud really was, it was really a bad situation. If you weren't prepared, you really suffered those three days. And, you know, uh, I mean, most of the people were young, so it wasn't that bad. <laughs> anyway, that afternoon, through most of the rain, we just stayed in the tent because there was really nowhere to go. There were people out, you know, walking through the mud and all that business, but we just stayed, um, we just stayed there. As the night went on, uh, though the rain let up, so then people started making, uh, you know, it would have been like a scene like this, but at night, and there were people setting campfires, you know, to stay warm and try to dry their clothes and stuff. So we went and started, um, you know, walking around on, uh, you know, here, you know, we split up and a couple of guys here, a couple of guys there. We started walking around. We didn't stay together as a group. We just went and some guys went down by the music. You know, I don't remember. I remember Ken Heat playing that night. Um, Melanie played in the daytime, I think. Um, Jefferson Airplane, I think, played the next day. Um, anyway, through the night, it was a rough night. You know, because you were still walking in mud now. You know, even though we weren't soaking wet, you were still walking in mud. You know, you had I had work boots on that I had brought with me because I was used to wearing them. And, you know, we were just basically walking, stayed up all night long. Finally, you know, maybe 4 o'clock in the morning, found our way back to the tent and just, like, slept for a few hours. Once the next day came, you know, next morning came up, people were looking to have breakfast. Um, I think we had a... I think we had made a little fire and we made coffee or something or we went and bought some stuff. Um, we had to go get something from my car. And when we went back to the car, I had a flat tire. So now it's Saturday. And the, the, the day wasn't bad. Saturday wasn't bad. I mean, the sun was out. It was all, it was mud, but, you know, on the field. But, you know, out on the, in the town, it wasn't bad. So we found our way back to the car. And I was with my two friends because my one friend wanted to go home. He wanted to leave soon. We had to get the tire fixed to get home if we wanted to get home. So we spent Saturday morning where we had to pull the Volkswagen out of the mud onto the road or at someplace solid where we could jack it up. We took the flat tire off and then we had to hitch a ride into town to get the tire fixed. We were able to get somebody to bring us to the to the um, gas station, which is maybe, I don't know, maybe a mile and a half down. It was just a little country gas station on a corner in town. And if you've ever seen the movie, they actually interview the guy that owned that gas station uh, in the film. 
he was able to fix a tire, put a plug in it and filled it up and we were able to get it back to the car by hook or crook, either walking or rolling it. I don't know how we got back to be honest with you. But we got it fixed and that was how we spent most of that, uh, that Saturday day and afternoon. Uh, we saw some of the music acts at night, that Saturday night. Uh, I don't remember who we saw. I remember seeing Judy Collins, uh, Can't Eat the List is in here, Santana. I mean, I remember seeing Santana. I remember seeing the dead. Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead were there. I remember seeing Arlo Guthrie, Tim Harden, uh, Joe McDonald and the Country Fish. I remember seeing them. Crosby, Sills and Nash. I remember seeing them. Uh, I remember Ravi Shankar playing, Sly. I remember Joan Baez playing. But anyway, by Sunday morning, we were exhausted. We were shot. Um, my friend wanted to go home. He, you know, he had to leave. We were like, you know, full of mud, dirty, you know, stinky, whatever. We weren't soaking wet, but we survived. And we left Sunday morning while Jimi Hendrix was playing the Star Spangled Banner. And looking down, it's like that picture you see in the film with all the garbage and stuff was all over the place. But we did come, we ended up coming back to Elizabeth on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> well, I remember going back to work on that Monday being really tired. <laughs> but I had to show up, so. Everybody asked me, did I see any nude, nude bathers? We did see them as I, we were going to get our tire fixed. They were swimming in the river there. <laughs> On the, on the construction job, that's you know, that's pretty much what they were asking me about. <laughs> do you think they could ever do anything like that today? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. <laughs> it was three days, but I don't remember much. Most of what I remember is just some of the pictures in here, and you know, some of the funny incidents that happened with myself and my friends along the way. <laughs>